God Stories. We're in the middle of a season of Lent in which we're sharing together in our primary services about God Stories. And God shows up in all sorts of ways, in expected ways and in unexpected ways. And in fact, our entire scriptures are all about these stories. How humanity has connected with divine life, how divine life has responded, but also how humanity has connected with one another and how that might give us a sense of who this divine life is and how this divine life works in our lives. So I decided as we're starting this journey together in this digital time together, that I would do counter stories. In other words, that I would look for some of these stories that might be kind of the underbelly of the scriptural text. So I am inviting you today to kind of stick with me as we tell these counter narratives. And even in those, at first, some of them might seem a bit off, but even there, pay attention. The story's been told. Divine life is truly at work. And I cannot think of a better one than one of the first counter narratives in all of scripture, the story of Cain. Now, just for us to all be together, you know, about this story, Cain is the son of Adam and Eve. And you might remember Adam and Eve were created and then they were living in this garden and then they disobeyed and then something happens, right? They are kicked out of the garden. Now, that's a whole nother sermon altogether that I don't have time for today. But they have these children. They have Cain and they have Abel. And these are beautiful little boys. These boys grow up to be uh, handsome young men and they each have a different approach to life and a different approach to their vocation. So, Cain was a farmer, and Abel was a shepherd. Now, in this ancient mythological story, these are two kind of families of ways of doing certain things, right? These are two kind of clans that are quite prevalent in this ancient Near Eastern society. People who are shepherds, who have herds, and then people who are farmers. And so these naturally, the story is naturally bringing to the surface a certain tension that's here in, in these ancient cultures and ancient societies. And I want us to remember this too, that in these ancient stories, part of what's at play is that these stories are trying to communicate certain realities that are happening all around us every time. So just imagine today, if we were having this story together, uh, how would we tell stories about what we are observing in the world today? But anyways, I digress. So Cain and Abel, Cain, farmer, Abel, shepherd. And now these, these two men bring an offering to God as, as part of their, we might call it, religious practice. They bring their, their offerings to God. But something interesting happens. God is pleased with Abel's offering, and God is displeased with Cain's offering. Now, there have been, uh, there's been a lot of ink spilled on why the divine life accept Abel's offering and not Cain's. The text seems to suggest that Abel chose the best of his herd to offer to God, and that Cain wasn't as attentive to that best. What else is happening here, though, we might ask? What's happening with divine life itself, right? But the point is that Cain gets jealous of his brother Abel and kills him. And now we have in this ancient story quite a reality for all of us. And that is that so often in our own lives, we we become jealous, angry at the other, And we can respond in quite unhelpful and tragic ways. And in fact, it happens in our own families, right? These kind of jealousies and struggles happen in our own families. So in some real ways, this story of Cain, this ancient story, is a story of, of family and family life and what happens in families. Now, it is quite tragic and quite melodramatic 
um, for sure, right? But it has, it does give us a hint about our lives together in these families of ours. Think about it for you in this moment. All of us were born into some kind of familial arrangement, whatever that might look like. Maybe, maybe you were born into mom and dad and a sibling, or maybe grandmother raised you, or maybe an aunt and uncle, or maybe you were a, a foster child for a family. W whatever it was, you, you came into the world and were connected in some way to, to a, a kind of system, a network of relationships. Now, some of those relationships were amazing and excellent. Some others were not so. But you, we were born and, and kind of grew up in these networks of relationships to one another. Now, if we just take one moment, we recognize that each of those relationships had their own complexities, uh, had their own situations. Uh, each of those connections themselves were fraught uh, with possibility for sure, but also with with some of the, the underbelly of what it means to be human, right? The, the pride that we sense, the egocentrism that's part of our lives, the, the ways in which we want things our particular way. And so we have that at play in each and every one of our relationships. And so, so in this early narrative, we're being given a sense that these were ancient concerns too. What happens when we have these feelings of jealousy and struggle? Why didn't God accept my offering, Cain wondered. I mean, he wasn't even really sure why that had happened. And, and, and could it be that Abel got a, a little self-centered and prideful about the fact that God accepted his sacrifice and not Cain's? You see it, don't you? The reality of life together in our families. You might have had a sibling who was constantly you know, prideful, and, and, and you might have thought that maybe mom and dad or grandma or your aunt, maybe they had a favorite and you weren't it. Or, or maybe you do recognize, maybe you were the favorite in the family. And think about those dynamics at play in that very moment. And so this ancient story, this counter story, is introducing us to the, a certain reality of life together. This, these familial interconnections that are deeply ancient in our own lives as human beings. And now the question is, in light of that reality, what's the good news? Because the good news cannot be that, you know, someone murders another person. That is actually bad news. The good news cannot be that, that we feel this jealousy and that that's cool. No, 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 that's bad news. The text, though, gives us some hints about what we might want to think about together today, about the good news aspect of this counter story. And there's two basic things that I want you to walk away with. The first one is that, that God does not turn God's back upon Cain. God actually encounters Cain where he's at. Uh, God has this conversation with Cain, kind of calling Cain to accountability. Where is your brother, divine life says. And, and that, that great, great quote by Cain, am I my brother's keeper? It turns out that yes, yes, we are a brother's keeper. And so God continued to reach to Cain and connect with Cain and trying to get Cain to, to turn their life into a, a better way. And in fact, God marks Cain to protect them from the other humans who might see that he is a murderer and might want to take revenge upon Cain. Did you hear me? That even this murderer gets this sign by God to protect them from someone who wanted to take vengeance upon him. So the first thing in our lives together, no matter the circumstance, no matter how wayward we become in our lives, even in our most familial kind of connections, is that God never turns God's back on us. God's always seeking, searching, connecting, providing grace, even marks on our foreheads. Uh, God is, is constantly seeking to restore us, to reconnect us, and that's what God does here. And the second thing that I want us to remember today about this counter-narrative is that the text doesn't hide the reality of us humans. 
And sometimes we in church circles can get so worried about these things. We want, we want to have it all together. We, we want to come across as if, you know, we, we, we are perfect, right? We, we have no problems here. Everything's good here, right? Uh, in fact, I've heard some people say even that, well, I would like to go to church, but first I want to get my life together. Well, the, the, these kind of narratives remind us of something. We don't, actually don't have to get our lives together. It is in seeking community and in seeking connection, it is in that encounter with divine life that we are made whole, that we are forgiven, that we can begin again. No matter how difficult our family life, no matter how complex the mistakes have been in us or in others against us, that there's always a pathway. That's what this, these counter narratives remind us of, is that, that, that being human is, is it's part of, of, of our own way of being in the world, right? And that, that divine life is seeking us and searching us, yes, but also providing us for a way, a different way, a way of love and compassion and new life, no matter our mistakes, no matter our frailties, no matter how, how disoriented we become. This text doesn't hide that, the reality of the grittiness of that so that we can be reminded of the connection, of the justice, of the new life, of the forgiveness, of the reconciliation. And so people of God, today, I invite you to encounter these stories, these counter stories. I invite you to encounter Cain and the others that we'll speak about in the weeks ahead and begin to see in the grit of these stories, the possibilities that you and I have and the entire world for new life, for connection, for community, no matter how messy it gets in between. Thanks be to God. Amen.